Over the last 20 years that we at Jewish Grace Ministries have been studying this, um, I have become very attached uh, to the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. I, I have these items to tell you who Jesus is. I have these items to tell you who the Messiah is, to point you towards Jesus, okay? And, and to be honest and open, I, I am not Jewish. I, I am Gentile. And I do not want anyone to think that there is any other way to the Messiah, to Jesus, than through Jesus. There's no other way to heaven. There's no other way to God than through Jesus. I don't do this to impress. I don't do this to be a wannabe. There is one way to heaven, and that is through the shed blood of Jesus. I use what Jesus used. I use what the Scriptures give me to use to, to hopefully teach you a little bit more about the Passover season and who Jesus is. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion, he will not only let them go, but under compulsion, he will drive them out. Then God said further to Moses and said to him, I am Adonai. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Israel, Jacob, as God Almighty El Shaddai. By my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them in acts and great miracles. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. And I've also heard their groaning of the sons of Israel whom the Egyptians have enslaved, and I have faithfully remembered my covenant. I remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will free you from their bondage. I will redeem and rescue you. I will redeem and rescue you with outstretched, vigorous, powerful arms and with great acts of judgment against Egypt. Then I will take you for my people. I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Exodus chapter 6. A promise to not only the Jewish people, to the Hebrews, but really to all. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Redemption from bondage and freedom. My name is Rob Pauley and I'm president and founder of Jewish Grace Ministries. And my home church, The Lake, here in Arlington, has asked me and given me the privilege to talk about the Passover Seder. Now, this is not going to be an entire Seder as we don't have time. We're not going to have all of the elements of the Seder all of the various things, the parsley, the uh, salt water, various different items that have been added over the years. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about that redemption. We're going to talk about that freedom from bondage. Through the matzah, the unleavened bread, and the four cups of wine that would have been drunk during that faithful night so many years ago. First in Egypt, and then with the Messiah in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. But to start this story, we need to go back a little bit, back to Genesis where God calls on Abraham. And He calls Abraham from a place that we understand today being modern-day Iraq and Scripture is Ur of the Chaldean. And He said, get up, take up, take your people, Go to a land that I will show you. And once he brought him into Canaan, into the land of Israel, he made a promise to him that everywhere you go, everywhere your foot touches, I will give you this land. This is an unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham. Everything is based on this. God didn't say, if you do this, I'll do that. It's completely 100% unconditional. God put His name and His Word on the line to Abraham. That covenant was reconfirmed or continued with Isaac 
and then Jacob. And you remember the story, Jacob has 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. And we follow the 12 tribes through their ups and downs throughout much of the beginning of the, the, the Bible, the Christian Bible, the Old Testament, the Torah in Hebrew. We follow their movements and their ups and their downs, their successes and their failures. There's brothers against brothers. One brother is sold into slavery, Joseph. He goes there and God redeems him. He lofts him up to a high position in Egypt. And we know through Scripture that during that bondage, that rose of Pharaoh who didn't know who Jacob was. He didn't know that Jacob was special to God and therefore special to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Joseph stays in Egypt. He dies in Egypt. And the children of Israel begin a 400 year captivity in Egypt. Now, as the 400 years are coming to a close, that's where this story picks up in Exodus chapter 6 that I just read to you. We know the story of Moses. He's called out to be the liberator of the Jewish people, to be the voice of God, him and his brother Aaron. And they're sent to Pharaoh with the Word of God to let my people go. Now, as we come to this night, the night of the Passover, the night that the Lord passed over in Egypt, Moses is told to do a few special things. He says, this month shall be the first month for you. And on the tenth day of that month, you need to pick a lamb. This lamb will be blameless. It will be spotless. It will be without blemish. It will be of the first year of a male lamb. You can take it from the sheep or the goats, but you must take it one for every family. So I, I get the image of this is that the father and in the, the houses in Egypt at the time were probably one large room, maybe two for cooking. But they had to take this lamb out for the on the 10th day of the month to watch it for five days, the 10th through the 14th. One week, they had to look at this animal. And they had to watch it for a blemish to see if it was all white, if it had a black hair, if it had a nasal discharge, if its hoofs began to curl. If anything was blemished, it was not going to be adequate to be used. So they either took that animal into their home with them, or they would have staked it by their front door. But either way, every time they entered or exited the house, they were with that lamb, looking at it very painstakingly, hands-on, to determine and to meet the requirements of a perfect lamb. You think they got attached to it a little bit? Especially the kids, a year old baby lamb in the house. But then God told Moses to do something else. He said on the 14th day of that month, the entire assembly of Israel shall kill that lamb, shall slaughter that lamb. And not only do you slaughter that lamb, you are to cook it in a particular way, roast it. Roasting in the Old Testament, in the Torah, is judgment. That innocent, perfect, unblemished lamb was roasted in judgment as a substitute. I don't know that Moses and the Jewish people and 
the Gentiles that were there with them that participated in this quite understood what that picture was foreshadowing. I think we do. And we're going to talk about that. They were also to take some of the blood and they were to put it on the three posts of the house. And they were to go in their house and shut the door and be under lock and key and curfew because they could not go out. They were to remain in the house on the night of the Passover because God was coming to render judgment for His promise that He would judge Egypt for what they had been doing to Israel. God also told Moses that this was to be a memorial, something that is done every year. And the Jewish people throughout Scripture, you can see, were, were faithful most of the time outside of certain bondages and in the diaspora at times under other oppression, kept the Passover. It's one of the, the three obligatory feasts that God said that all male Jews should ascend and make Aliyah to the holy city of Jerusalem. So we see as we move into the New Testament, the Bet Hadashah, that Jesus and His disciples, Jews that they were, would have made the pilgrimage up to Jerusalem, the ascent of the Aliyah, on the Passover. And many times in Scripture, what we see this as is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is kind of been grouped together as Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, which will become much clearer to you by the end of this, as one seven-day feast. So when you're reading in the Scripture and you see the Feast of Unleavened Bread, know that that is the Passover. Now, one of the things that God told Moses is that they were to have cups of wine unleavened bread leaven as we know meaning sin so it is a piece of bread with no leaven in it and the wine and many believers in Jesus understand this as the Lord's Supper but understand this was going on thousands of years before Jesus instituted that I often wonder why this system or this feast was done over and over and over. Was it so when Jesus sat and took that last Passover meal before His crucifixion, it would be understood when He said, my body and my blood. I don't know. We'll have to see. But you go back to Exodus to talk about what God promised Moses about this night. It's easy to see the Jews being in captivity in, in Egypt as being captive, but I'm here to tell you, and I think you understand captivity is a little different. As we film this and talk about this in Israel right now, they are under quarantine. They can't leave their homes on Passover. I found that very ironic. Due to COVID-19, we are somewhat of bondage, but we are also bond to sin. And we understand that. So through these four cups, through this matzah, I'm going to continue what Jesus did that night of the Passover. And we remember Jesus leaves the Sea of Galilee and He heads and He heads up to Jerusalem. And He goes to Bethpage, which is just on the back side of the Mount of Olives. He ascends up to the Mount of Olives and he looks over the city. And he tells his disciples, go find the man who has the donkey. So that the prophet Zechariah was proven correct. The Messiah, the King of Israel, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The palm branches and the leaves and the cloaks were put down. And he was heralded as a king. Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai Elocheno Yeshua HaMashiach Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord Jesus the Messiah. 
the palm branches were waving and everything was glorious as he rode in on that Palm Sunday. But what happened that week is the same thing that happened to that lamb in Egypt. We know from Scripture that after he's ridden in, everywhere that Jesus went, he met with some type of confrontation. Whether it was money changers on the Temple Mount in the court of the Gentiles, whether it was somebody trying to get him to lie or to be blasphemous or find some fault with him. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the rulers of the day, are you who you say you are? Who are you? Come on, really? They were looking for something. They were looking for that blemish. See, if I'm going to tell you Jesus is the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the earth, then he must fulfill every part of that Passover. Was he judged? Absolutely. Everywhere he went that week. He's judged. He's on the Mount of Olives again. And his disciples said, Where do you want us to do the Passover? Rabbi, where are we going to have it? We have to prepare for it. We have to do things for it. Where do you want to go? He says, There's a place. So they go into town, they get in the room, and it's Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus begins as the Father, as the Abba to these men. And one thing that's always struck me is how he talks about how anxious he is to take this particular Passover with them. He knows what's coming. Friday's here for Jesus. But Sunday's coming. Jesus begins with a prayer, the blessing of the wine. It's called the Kadush. And basically what that is, is just giving thanks to His Father for providing the wine and the bread. It's like we do at a meal. He was giving respect and honor and just saying thank you. And then, He begins with the first cup of wine. It's the, called the, the cup of sanctifications. And sanctification meaning just a fancy word for set apart. It's set apart from all else and it's set apart for God's purpose. Exodus 6 says, I will bring you out. The Lord said unto Moses now, you will see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he shall let you go, and with a strong hand he will drive you out. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and made a covenant with them. See, this is cup, the sanctification. It's when God called out of Egypt the Jewish people, the Israelites for a special purpose. We could spend a few hours here, but one of the purposes of the Jewish people was to usher in the Messiah to the world. I want you to think about that. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who createst the fruits of the vine, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, who has chosen us from the service from among the nations. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life, who has preserved us, and has enabled us to reach this season.
Jesus would have taken that cup and made that blessing over it. Luke twenty two seventeen tells us that he took the cup and gave thanks. It was the Kaddush. After this first cup, the washing of the hands would take place. And one of the family members around the table would bring a basin of water and bring it around. And one family member would bring the bowl of water around and a towel to each member so that they could wash their hands. It's not like today where you would go to the sink. You just got a bowl of water and it was passed. And you washed your hands. It was the, the symbolic of purification of food and the beginning to prepare and handle the food. But we know from John chapter 13 that Jesus rose from the supper, laid aside His garment, took a towel, and girded Himself. After that, He poured water into the basin and began to wash His disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which He had girded. He washed the feet, not the hands. The feet is the dirtiest part of the body. Complete servitude. After that, the second cup is called the cup of plagues. And we remember in Genesis, it says, I will rescue you. I imagine a lot of us feel now that we need some rescuing with the COVID-19. Jesus is rescuing. Long ago, He's telling us. And I don't think there's any time that this is more important for understanding now what they were afraid of in Egypt and some of the things that He was rescuing them. It's not just from slavery, but it was from a list of things. One of the things that's, that's kind of become tradition now in a Jewish household and I can't tell you that Jesus did this. But they take a cup of wine, this cup of plagues, and what they will do is they will dip some on their finger and they will let it drip onto the plate. And every time they do this, they say that the bondage is for frogs, and lice, and beasts, and disease, and boils locust, darkness, and death. They're shaking it off. They're getting rid of it. They're understanding that this is rescue. That through this, they are being rescued from that. Exodus goes on to say, and I have also heard the groaning of my children, Israel, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Guys, I don't know where your Egypt is. This is not just for Jewish people. You will see through the rest of this that as Gentiles, we too have this. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage. I will redeem you with outstretched arms. One of the things that I find interesting here is that at this time, the meal takes place and there would have been a very large, huge meal eaten at that time. After the second cup of plagues, the traditional meal is eaten in today's Seder. Uh, during Moses' day on the original and only really Passover, is when they would have taken the 
bread and eating it and the salt water and other elements of the Passover. But now there's a big meal and families are together and it's festive time and, and everybody has a great time. And the history of the nation of Israel is told through various different questions and various different answers and, and games and whatnot. Um, but after the meal, there is an interesting thing that takes place. Um, and it has to do with the unleavened bread. That after the meal, the matzah begins to play a large part in the Seder. There is a matzah bag, and inside the bag, there are three separate containers or separate areas. And each one has its own piece of matzah. Well, during this part of the matzah, or this part of the Seder, the middle piece of the three is taken It's broken in two, and a white cloth, or a white bag, known as the afikolim. This white bag with unleavened, no sinned bread is taken and removed. And hidden away. The other piece is put back. I have asked many of my friends, rabbis, Jewish believers, non believers, pre believers, why the middle piece of matzah? And there's no customary reason. That place apart. In a few minutes. After the afikoman is set aside, the third cup, the cup of redemption. The word re redemption in Hebrew refers to a price that must be paid to be redeemed. To rescue or to deliver someone. It is a legal term that concerns the substitution required for a person to be delivered from bondage. I find it very interesting that in this order, Seder meaning order, that in this order the cup of redemption goes with the sinless bread. Exodus 6, 6 says, Wherever, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt, and I will rid you of the bondage, and I will redeem you with outstretched arm and with great judgment. You say, okay, Rob, this is neat. This is Old Testament. Matthew 26, 6 and says, As they were eating. So we know that Jesus was part of the Seder. They were having the meal. Now, as they after they come back from the meal and the meal is done, the cup of redemption is drank. Today, send the kids out to go find the white bag that was put away for a while. We've, we've been through all of the cups. We understand sanctification, that we've been called and set apart. We understand that we have been rescued from our bondage. We understand that we are to be redeemed, that we need a rescuer to deliver us. Now, we send the kids out as part of the game to go seek 
that which has been gone. And so whoever finds the bag in tradition gets a piece of chocolate or some treat. John tells us in his gospel that after the meal, Jesus did something different. Jesus began to explain in a way that I think the 12 began to understand it a little bit through their tradition of the Passover. It was at this time, after the meal, Judas is gone. Just prior to this, Scripture tells us that Jesus said, go do what you must. Matthew 26, 6 says, as they were eating, and as they finished, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Now, I, I can't tell you that when Jesus and the disciples were in the upper room that there was an happy coma and they actually went and hid there. I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you is happy coma is a Greek word, not a Hebrew word. So it would have had to have been used after Greek began to be spoken. We know it was spoken during Jesus' day, so it's very likely. So as Jesus gets this perfect, sinless, leavenless piece of bread, He broke it from the middle of the three in the bag. He wraps it and puts it in a white linen cloth And it goes away for a while. The fourth cup. Again, after supper, and he took the cup, he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink it all. Don't sip it. Don't just taste it. Drink every drop. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is said for you, many for the remissions of sin. This cup is the cup of acceptance, the cup of praise. The last part of Exodus 6 or 7, And I will take for you, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of what? The scripture says Egyptians. But as a believer, Jesus, Yeshua. Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. Egyptians can be a blank. If you're trying to praise, you're trying to get rid of a bondage, you're trying for acceptance, you're trying for all that, why would you just take a little of it? Drink a full he said that shows completeness that shows fulfillment 
Jesus says of this cup, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Praise God. I get to have a Passover meal with the King in heaven. Because what He did for me and what He did for you. We started this out with talking about roasting and judgment and innocence. Jesus leaves the upper room or leaves the area of the Passover and they are singing. They are singing the Hallel, a song of praise. Jesus knew what faced him. Jesus knew what that week what the next couple of days would hold. He leaves the room and he's singing. You think my name ran across his mind? Do you think your name ran across his mind in the Garden of Gethsemane while he was there praying? I find it interesting that as Jesus is praying in the Garden, he says, Lord, if this can be taken from me, but not my will, but yours. Jesus had to shed blood to redeem us, to make us accept, acceptable to Him. Jesus is the Lamb. Where was Jesus taken out of the Lamb as the innocent deal? On the Garden of Gethsemane. He was betrayed at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was arrested. He was taken out of the Garden of Gethsemane. He was walked from the Garden of Gethsemane down across the Kidron Valley up into Caiaphas' house where he was beaten, whipped, tortured. They were looking for some reason to do something to him. He was taken from from. Caiaphas' house to Pilate's house. Back and forth. Illegal trials held at night. No quorum. The judge was part of the order. Many things that were illegal and wrong. But the Scripture says they found no fault. False witnesses were brought. They said, crucify Him. He was led, beaten, sped upon, yelled at, kicked, punched. It's an old rock quarry outside of the city walls. Friday was here. Friday was here for the Messiah. But just as this bag tells us, They went and found it, pulled it out, and the body of the Messiah was here. Nailed to a cross, dead, put away in a grave for a short period of time. And then Sunday came. And the tomb was empty. The Messiah was gone to the right hand of God the Father. Thank you for allowing me to visit with you and come into your home. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Don't forget to pray. Pray for the peace of Israel.